I'll just, as I said, I will uh, just share my screen, not because the slides say anything all that interesting, but just as a way of keeping everybody focused. I know my own attention wavers on Zoom as I try, as I do uh, prone to do four things at once on my computer screen, and it just helps everybody sort of follow along. So thank you, Danielle, so much for inviting me. Uh, as I said, I wish I could be there with you uh, in person, though perhaps not at this time of year, as we in Minneapolis are just emerging from winter and finally enjoying our long awaited spring. Yes, it often takes to May to actually get rid of the snow from our ground, at least April. This year was actually a pretty good one. Um, so I've been told that I should speak for about 20 to 30 minutes. It'll probably be just around 30 minutes, I think. Um, I wish I could more for the short side, but one of the challenges when you have a paper that is still relatively new and relatively fresh is you don't always know how to get through it relatively quickly and effectively. So <clears throat> now, as Danielle said, this is a paper that I'm working on. It's not part of a larger book project, it's, but it is part of a larger collaboration actually on endogenous sources of contestation and liberal international order. The paper itself is co-authored with uh, my longtime collaborator, Stacey Goddard of Wellesley College, and I'm coming to you at, I think, a perfect time in its development. Um, full disclosure, the paper was not surprisingly rejected at international security. Uh, that doesn't entirely surprise me. Um, but uh, we then put it down for a little bit and we are just returning to it now and making some uh, revisions to the paper. And the paper, as Danielle mentioned, speaks to uh, what we think are, is one of the basic questions confronting contemporary international relations. And that is why is the post-war international order enduring such fundamental contestation? We may disagree over whether it is or isn't in crisis. Some would say that it's even the liberal international order is on its deathbed, but regardless of exactly where you place it, and I don't have a dog in that fight, it is as surely in recent years been faced increasingly with challenge, not just within the terms of the order, but of the challenge of the order's basic underpinnings and principles. And especially since 2016, many have asked why has the post-war order been the subject of order challenge, what we would call order challenging contestation and not merely order consistent contestation. Um, and why has it endured rejection and exit? Why has it endured efforts to design brand new institutions along fundamentally divergent lines and not merely reform? Now there have been over the last, really the, I would say about the last 10 to 15 years and especially the last five, mountains of literature on this very question, including many essays in the recently released uh, 71st anniversary issue of International Organization, if any of you have taken a look at it. And most of that literature, I think it's fair to say, emphasizes a variety of exogenous factors. A smaller hill of literature emphasizes endogenous ones. But what none of these really take issue with and what Stacy and I try to put front and center in this project is the order's liberalism. We argue that in fact that the order's liberal underpinnings, that is precisely what the order's defenders believe to be its greatest strength, that those underpin liberal underpinnings are in important ways responsible for threats to the post-war international order's health. In a nutshell, our argument is that the liberal language in which the order was legitimated impeded its responsiveness, delegitimized and silenced dissent, or at least made that possible, and serve to frustrate reform initiatives. Over time, it consequently channeled demands for reform, again, order consistent contestation, into resistance, order challenging contestation. That's the big take home point. Now that likely strikes you as perhaps counterintuitive in the extreme and maybe even to a fault because we generally tend to associate liberalism with capaciousness and flexibility. So over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, let me tell you how we arrived at this conclusion. We start in this paper from the premise that international orders are always marked by conflict because they necessarily apportion benefits and allocate burdens unevenly. But contestation of the order can take place on multiple registers. The first is loyalty. Many discontented actors, regardless of their dissatisfaction, play by the rules, whether as a strategy for survival or because they cannot conceive of alternatives. There are a range of other actors that engage in order consistent contestation. They want to affect limited change in line with the order's principles. Their order consistent demands for reform focus on second tier elements, such as 
how the order distributes costs and benefits, when it permits exceptions to the rules. And one might thirdly think of order challenging contestation. That is where conflict revolves around the order's underlying principles and normative vision. Order challenging dissent isn't trying to enhance the order's efficiency as some order consistent contestation would. Um, doesn't try to tweak its distribution of costs and benefits. Consider radical critics of the global economic order, for instance, who see little value in a system that promotes exploitative economic relationships. There's a variety of behaviors that are consistent with order consistent, order challenging contestation, excuse me, from at a minimum efforts to water down the rules to the explicit rejection of binding rules to exit from the order's institutions to an organized campaign of systemic transformation. And the more order challenging contestation you have, you end up with this perception, rightly or wrongly, of an order that is in crisis. And that yields the analytical question that lies at the heart of this paper, which is why and when, why has dissatisfaction with the liberal order yielded order challenging contestation? This is actually, I think, a puzzle for much international relations theory. On the one hand, we have liberal institutionalists and liberal constructivists who argue that the order has served a crucial role by supplying consensus public goods that would otherwise be in short supply. Um, think, well, obviously, the seminal work here is folks like John Eikenberry. Now, if we adopt that approach, why would state or non-state actors seek to topple an inclusive order that furthers the common good and whose multilateral forums and transparent processes enjoy legitimacy as Eikenberry and many others would have us believe. The order's liberal institutions, a wide range of theorizing suggests, should limit the scope of contestation because they promote transparency, because they socialize states to existing norms, because they allow for issue linkage, because they are deliberative and inclusive. So you'll see, obviously, for those who know the IR literature, references here to theorizing emerging out of the liberal rationalist tradition to more constructivist theorizing. From a liberal standpoint, only those who are irrational or illiberal would reject the order's basic compacts. Now, in mind, that may not surprise you, right, that liberal institutional constructivism don't have a good story for this. But I even want to suggest that realism doesn't have a great story for this. Realists would seem on their face to have a simple and powerful story that looks a lot like from, go back to Robert Gilpin. As the global distribution of power shifts, rising great powers naturally seek new institutions that reflect their interests, their values, and their status. Yet, as even Bill Walforth, right, a leading realist has argued, has suggested in a piece now over a decade old, those rising powers did very well, and they indeed, they did disproportionately well under the existing order or their relative power would not have grown in the first place. What rational reason would they have to seek to change the rules of the game? Uh, and there are many who write on China in precisely this vein. Even more puzzling from a realist perspective are exit pressures arising in the core because with the rise of the rest, any renegotiation of the order's terms as say Donald Trump would want will necessarily come at the core's expense from within a realist standpoint. And so when realists grapple with order challenging contestation, they turn to a series of concepts that have absolutely nothing to do with realism, which is why John Mearsheimer invokes the exogenous factor of nationalism to try to explain resistance to the liberal international order. Those are our more exogenous and I think dominant accounts. Our work here is inspired by a variety of series of important endogenous accounts rooted in liberal order self-undermining successes. And to very briefly summarize, an emerging, a still small, but emerging literature. Um, I mean, there obviously is literature that says that liberal order by failing to live up to its liberal values, right? It's hypocrisy. America behaving in ways contrary to the order of which it's the chief spokesperson. That's why the order is uh, subject to problems. But there are also those who say it's the very successes of liberal order. Now to summarize that, by empowering weaker members at the expense of the order's founders, by granting authority to international institutions, which are not accountable, as Michal Tsurin argues in, in his important work, by promoting free markets and economic growth, which hollowed out the welfare state and increased social precarity, 
lot of literature in this vein on the rise of nationalist populism and by nurturing transnational networks that mobilize resentments in the semi-periphery and in the core as Rebecca Adler Nissen and, um, uh, uh, why is her name escaping me at the moment? Uh, Aisha Zarakol argued in their most recent piece in IO. By all of these variety of arguments, the liberal international order so doubt about its benefits, generated confusion about its accountability and empowered its opponents. But even these endogenous answers, as powerful as they are, generally suggest that the liberal international order has fallen on hard times because it has not been liberal enough, either because it has not extended democracy to the international realm or because it has not been sufficiently committed to maintaining equality of opportunity for all. These insightful accounts have left the order's ideological foundations untouched. And they typically suggest that the order's contemporary problems derive from choices made within the range of liberal solutions, like going from embedded liberalism to neoliberalism, not with the hardcore of liberalism itself. That's where we come in, right? That we wanna maintain that the order's contemporary problems really derive from its liberal legitimation. And we highlight what I think are three unquestionable pillars of the ways in which the liberal order has been legitimated really from the 1940s forward. Pillar number one is that transatlantic and American elites justify liberal international order as providing needed global public goods. And thereby in the 1940s, the argument went avoiding a repeat of the tragedies of the 1930s. That post-war order called on states to set aside their short-term interests in the service of long-term self-interest. And the order's legitimating discourse crucially cast these as universal public goods benefiting all. At the beginning, they served only a club, but they were never cast as club goods. They were universal goods. Now, there was an important contrast in this narrative, just as there is in any narrative. And the other here was the Western states of the 1930s, who in responding to the Great Depression with beggar thy neighbor trade policies, displayed a distinct lack of commitment to any sense of the common good. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two really gets at the liberal content of that common good, right? With that orders institutions embodied a particular vision, the belief that institutions that provided free and fair opportunities for all to pursue their individual interests would in the end leave all better off. And that too marked a strong contrast. The contrast here was the strong, deeply substantive communist vision of a society marked by equality of outcomes. And the third pillar, also uh, deeply rooted in the liberal tradition, has to do with the rule of law, the virtues of a system of transparent and binding rules to which all are subject, even those who write and enforce them. This liberal vision of the good society was thus one in which politics was ultimately shunned to decide in favor of law. Politics was the realm of power, competition, and coercion. In the post-war order, law, rules, regulations, that was the realm of reasoned discourse and peaceful conflict resolution. And so in the vision, though it was only in its infancy in the 40s, it begins to flower by the end of the Cold War. That's the vision, a world of law. A world of, world of law. It's not accidental for those who remember Anne-Marie Slaughter and John Eikenberry's famous 2006 report, a world of liberty under law. That's the vision. And again, there was an important narrative contrast to the fascist states of the 1930s, who in the discourse of Roosevelt and other Western leaders represented an international order governed by power, by force and coercion, not by law. And they are replaced in the 1940s and 1950s by communists who again, unconstrained in their godless pursuits, confined by no law, divine or man-made. Those are the three fundamental pillars. Those three, contestation is of course a given in global politics. What matters is how does any order respond to order consistent contestation? And the post-war liberal order responded in ways consistent with those three legitimation pillars, but in ways that also ultimately transformed order consistent contestation into order challenging contestation. That first pillar, I should have named it here instead of calling it pillar number one, I apologize. The first pillar, the claim that the order served a universal common good 
made possible and encouraged the delegitimation of even modest reform. Claims based on either the national interest on the one hand or alternative definitions of the common good were at odds with the order's insistence that it provided public good and furthered humanity's common interests. Those rhetorical formulations presumed that members of the international community agreed on what goods were public and what interests were common. They rested in turn on the tacit assumption of a universal subject. This liberal logic therefore could not conceive of alternative ways of being, except as contrary to universal reason or nature. Consider claims on the basis of a distinctive national interest challenged liberal order because they rested on a foreign premise. Because if there were many national interests, then human existence and identity are irreducibly plural. Claims based on an alternative view of the public good were also intolerable, for they threatened to reveal that what the liberal order called the public good is nothing more and nothing less than a particular conception of the public good held by US decision makers at Bretton Woods and later elaborated by Western policymakers, diplomats, and international jurists and technocrats. Crucially, this liberal legitimation strategy contained a clear blueprint for stigmatizing reformist voices, casting them as deviants beyond the pale of legitimacy. If the global public good was treated in this discourse as obvious to any reasonable well-intentioned political actor, then advocates of different visions were ipso facto, either irrational, that is not reasonable, or selfish, if not evil, that is not well-intentioned. And as those who do harm to the global public, they are enemies of the global public and are therefore legitimate targets of coercion, even violence in its name. If you hear rogue states and all that, yes, right? It derives directly from liberal discourse. Pillar number two, that is that particular liberal vision of the public good uh, in terms of sort of free flows and everything that we're familiar with, right? Opportunities for individuals to pursue their natural self-interest. That second pillar legitimated an expansion of institution scope in response to order consistent contestation. Even as the order's defenders drew on liberal rhetoric to delegitimize reformers, they then leaned into that same rhetoric to co-opt reformers substantive concerns, because the order could not legitimately openly accommodate diverse national interests, because, but it could expand its definition of the common good. For example, as the trade regime came under fire from the global south, its definition of global public good stretched to include development and human rights. If institutions that provided free and fair opportunities for all to pursue their individual interests would in the end leave all better off as pillar number two insisted, then more such institutions covering a widening array of policy domains would be even better, which is what we've seen with the development of global governance. This move meant that a broadening array of issues over the decades were treated as matters of universal consensus, and thus a broader array of critics became subject to delegitimation and became potential enemies of the global public, right? With the expansion per pillar number two, pillar number one has more and more of the world to react to. Pillar number three uh, led to growing precision and ultimately to greater rigidity. Pillar number three is the virtues of the rule of law. Now remember, as many have argued, Alex Cooley, Hendrik Spreut, ambiguity is often built by design into international rules and institutions as the necessary price for negotiated agreement. But ambiguity may be the grease that turns the political wheels. It also complicates compliance and enforcement. The rhetoric of the rules-based order sustained calls to quite naturally to close legal loopholes and better specify the law, diminishing the zone of flexibility further and rendering selective application of the rules less defensible. This pillar number three thus legitimated an ever more elaborate, dense and precise international legal and regulatory structure. From the perspective of a rule-based order, that was a very welcome development. Regulation and law gradually came to govern more and more of the space occupied by politics and power. But the more settled and specified the rules, the harder they become to change, the more rigid they are. Via these three critical pillars, the liberal legitimation of post-war order impeded reform. 
It provided the logic and the rhetorical resources with which to delegitimize would-be reformers. It complicated efforts to justify accommodating those who interests, whose interests suffered under the order. It sustained expanding the zone of law and governance at the expense of politics, thereby closing off routes of change. It generally rendered international order less flexible. And that's the next step of the story. It helped transform order consistent reformist impulses into deeper forms of resistance, rejection, and revisioning. Liberal legitimation mobilized order challenging contestation in both the order's core and periphery in different ways. I'm happy to talk about why that is, but I don't wanna get into the details too much here. But they followed these different paths, but ultimately to the same destination. Now in the periphery, as the order's liberal legitimation rendered it more, exp more expansive and less flexible, peripheral actors became increasingly frustrated by the order's hypocrisy and found it easier to mobilize like-minded like actors around an order challenging agenda. As the order's scope expanded, and here's this first, first bullet, bullet, excuse me, and more of global politics came under its purview. Charges of hypocrisy multiplied across diverse realms. What had once perhaps plausibly been represented as narrow issues of enforcement in particular domains came to seem like deep systemic problems. Moreover, as the order expanded, so did the number of aggrieved actors and charges of hypocrisy resonated ever more widely. Meanwhile, the, as the sort of the steady march of precision in law and regulation shown an increasingly bright light on the persistent unpunished hypocrisy of the privileged, right? The fewer loopholes there are, the more obvious it is when powerful actors are not playing by the rules. The liberal international orders expansion and growing rigidity also meant that dissatisfied peripheral actors grew ever more confident that they could find partners and build a durable coalition to challenge the order's basic tenets. That same expansion and precision also led to counter, more counter stigmatization. Now, by virtue of their structural position, actors on the periphery were more likely to be stigmatized as enemies of the global public. One possible response, and here Rebecca Adler Nissen's work is particularly important, is counter stigmatization, embracing one's ascribed identity as international society's deviance. Uh, it's not usually a very popular strategy. It's costly, it's challenging. But as international order became more rigid, thanks to its liberal legitimation, the benefits of counter stigmatization grew and its potential costs fell. As the legalized regime expanded, it multiplied the number of deviant actors running afoul of the law. So the social costs of deviance became less imposing because stigma loses its sting the more widely it is spread. And as the ranks of the deviant grew, the prospects for an order challenging coalition improved. That's the story we want to tell in the periphery. What about in the core? In the core, that same move of expansion of the order and the growing precision of the order produced what we call a revolution of the self-proclaimed victims. This has been a long-standing problem for liberal internationalism. It had long failed to respond effectively to a powerful nationalist counterargument that others had taken advantage and played the core for a fool. It was rooted in the framing of this ordering project in terms of the global good. If one's doing the global good, how is one doing the national good? The expansion of the order's scope and its increasing rigidity made this nationalist critique ever more resonant because as the liberal order morphed into global governance, the costs of providing a, an ever expanding array of global public goods seemed potentially endless and the benefits to the nation even more amorphous. And as international law and regulation became increasingly elaborate and unenforceable, excuse me, and enforceable, and as distant technocrats and regulators seemed to hold nations' fates in their hands, populations in core states became skeptical that the judicialization of global politics served their interests. So ultimately, these self-proclaimed victims demanded exit. That's the familiar narrative of the West's populist nationalists. Delegitimization and stigmatization led in the core to what we call 
revolutions of the virtuous. Now, some actors in the core were more likely to internalize the norms of liberal order. They were the true believers, holding tightly to the ideal of an order that would deliver public goods and tame the vagaries of power through law and reason. But over time, these true believers saw that the order did not produce equal goods for all, that there were dissenters challenging the order's definition of the common, that the order silenced and coerced alternative views. And so they held out for a radically different vision, a new vision of the global good. So here you see, they didn't, these were not, these virtuous didn't reject the dream of a cooperative global order, but thought the old vision had proved unfailingly corrupt. So this you see manifest, say, in Seattle protests against globalization in the WTO back in 1995. You see it in the nuclear ban treaty, TPNW, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which originated in the West. I'd like to make sure we have, I was going to, let me just say a brief word about sort of the empirics at the heart of this paper. So we've traced these dynamics in core and periphery, um, but I haven't said much, you know, how do we trace this out? So let me maybe impose on you just for three more minutes to talk about this in the context of the nuclear regime. The paper contains case studies of the trade regime and the nuclear regime. Um, Stacy's writing more about the trade regime, not that it's particularly her bailiwick, uh, but she's so completely reworking it, I know at this very moment, that I have no idea actually what it says. So I'm gonna focus on the nuclear regime, which I can speak to. Um, now, I'm happy to talk more about how this fits into the liberal order. Some would say, is this really a part of the liberal order? And certainly much writing suggests it. Slowing the spread of nuclear weapons would seem obviously to be in the interests of all humanity or so the liberal order presupposes. Yet the nuclear non-proliferation regime increasingly faces a variety of fundamental challenges that threaten the larger nuclear orders undoing. The regime's liberal legitimation strategy shaped how it responded to contestation in the 1990s when they discovered that there were states that were routinely evading their NPT commitments. And that led to really two dynamics. One was stigmatization. This is the height of the period of the rogues, mavericks, renegades, demons. This is where the, Bush, the um, United States under the Clinton administration starts adopting ever more aggressive tactics under the heading of counter-proliferation rather than non-proliferation. But the other side of it was growing precision. Grounded in the regime's li liberal legitimating language, non-proliferation regime leaders introduced numerous new rules to try to close all these loopholes from the IEA's binding additional protocol to the Bush administration's proliferation security initiative and on and on. And all of that yielded order challenging contestation exactly as our larger story, I think, suggests. Because beginning in the early 2000s, non-nuclear weapon states leaders began to doubt openly the regime's definition of the public good, really for the first time, particularly the double standard at its core. Argentine diplomats, for instance, routinely called the non-proliferation regime the disarmament of the damned. Non-proliferation counter-stigmatization, stigmatization yielded, excuse me, counter-stigmatization. India in 1998 not only explodes, of course, a nuclear bomb for the first time, but it embraces this language, page, the Indian foreign minister writes in the pages of foreign affairs, of nuclear apartheid, suggesting with particularly powerful uh, language how corrupt the entire regime was and how it needed to be overthrown, just like the apartheid regime. Of course, the Bush administration's vilification of the axis of evil did nothing but empower Iran's conservatives, energize its nuclear program, heighten tensions with a nuclear armed North Korea. Third, by the late 2000s, we have the beginnings of the revolution of the virtuous that leads to the passage of TPNW in 2017. I'm happy to talk more about how TPNW relates to the nuclear non-proliferation regime. It's often not clear, sometimes it's seen as quite compatible. I think it's actually a quite fundamental challenge. And fourth, you also have a nationalist revolution of the victims that's really manifest in the inability over 25 years, even when the Obama administration makes it a major priority of the United States to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, very much in 
the discourse of nationalism. Um, let me just close with a, a couple of larger implications and just at the end of my time. So the larger argument just to remind you is that the fragility of the contemporary international order is integrally connected to its liberal underpinnings. We do not claim that liberal legitimation is the sole or even the primary source of conflict among states, of course not. Nor do we claim that all challenges to the liberal order are endogenous. Some things really are exogenous. The refugee crisis, for instance, created major issues for the legitimation of the liberal regime in Europe. And that was, of course, quite an exogenous challenge. But liberal legitimation played an important, albeit not exclusive role, in channeling reformist impulses into resistance, in transforming order consistent into order challenging contestation in both the order's core and its periphery. Now, why this all matters, what are the stakes of this? Are can the liberal order be salvaged? If the challenges to liberal order were, as so many claim, exogenous alone, from illiberal states at the order's periphery to illiberal actors within its core, the order might be saved by redoubling commitment to an investment in its institutions. If the challenges are partly endogenous, rooted in policy and institutional changes, such as those that have exacerbated domestic inequality, as Colgan and Cohen have argued, the order might be saved through reforms that revive the embedded liberalism compromise of its founding to the problems neoliberalism, there's a solution for that within the order. But if, as we argue, liberal legitimation strategies themselves bear some significant responsibility, then neither of these solutions will be uh, sufficient. Rather, a more fundamental rethinking of the bases of international order may be warranted. And with that, I will stop just around 30 minutes. And I uh, eagerly await your questions. As I said, we are in the really very much at the heart of revising this paper and rethinking it. And in preparing this very talk, uh, I even had sort of a minor epiphany. So there are things that are really hot off the presses, so to speak, uh, here at this very moment. So I eagerly await your thoughts. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, I might ask people to use the raise hand function, which you can find in the reactions um, section. So I think Baogang has um, a question up first. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So, uh, Ron, uh, thank you very much for a great uh, paper. Uh, I, I found it really thought provocative. I, I just want to uh, question very basic assumption. So, in the last time, uh, in the when you towards the, uh, uh, concluding your talk, you you're talking about nuclear regime and the trade regime. So clearly, a trade region can be a part, very important part of liberal, region, liberal order. But I'm just uh, questioning the basic assumption whether nuclear regime can be part of liberal regime. So nature of nuclear regime is really uh, non-liberal because it's really want to ban other countries to freely develop their nuclear weapon. So it's a non-liberal non uh, nature, but it's for sake of for whole mankind. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to say that this is where uh, develop this region with defending liberal democracy only because uh, by the established nuclear regime, Russia, China, uh, India, Pakistan also benefit from it. So I'm just, uh, to what extent is this nuclear region itself, uh, is, uh, can we say this as a liberal region? Or is it actually is it nothing, it's, it's uh, not, uh, not part of liberal order. It's, it's a more broadly, it's, a, it's, it's an order so important for mankind, but we cannot characterize as a, a liberal order. When we characterize a liberal order, really is a biases, intellectual biases. I'm not sure, how, I, I, I might be wrong, just, just this is a very basic question. Can I ask you to clarify one thing? Is, is the core of your argument that it's not a liberal order because you have non-liberal states at the heart of the order? Yeah, so my, my, my basic, uh, to, to, to successfully establish a nuclear regime is uh, you need to adopt a coercive measure to stop or to prevent other countries, who, whatever they are, from developing nuclear weapons. This is a non-liberal uh, uh, non measure. So that's my question. Oh, but it's different from trade region. Trade region, basically, you want to promote the free trade. And 
then you need to take into kind of differentiate principle. So it's a different, but the, the starting point is a freedom, free trade. But here the nuclear regime starting point is a non-freedom. So some country you cannot produce nuclear weapon, very simple. So it cannot be classified as a, a, a part of a liberal order. It says I might be wrong, but I'm just a curious. Right? Daniel, what are your norms? Would you like me to respond to each question as we go or should we collect them? Um, what do you prefer? We usually, we don't have- whatever, whatever the norms I, when in, when in, when in <laughs> Australia do as the Australians do. Um, we have been taking questions at a time. I think that's been working well. So let's, let's go with that. I'm sorry, so one at a time? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, that's a great question, right? About, I mean, there are other way, reasons that one might object actually to including let me, let me make the question, let me build upon the question further, right? Why would you, is the nuclear order insofar as it, it intentionally recognizes that there are states with differential roles and responsibilities in the nuclear order. And it seeks to, it doesn't give everybody full access to the goods, right? That seems at odds at some level with, uh, with the principles of liberalism. And yet, the basic legit, so first of all, the nuclear proliferation regime, the non-proliferation regime, the NPT was not inherently coercive, right? There was a fundamental um, set of trade-offs uh, that at the heart of that, right? A bargain as it's often called, right? The idea was the spread of nuclear power in exchange fundamentally for non-proliferation. Uh, and the IAE of course had absolutely no coercive authority its only authority was that of monitoring. So we have a series of rules with different categories of actors with different rights and responsibilities, which is true of many areas of the law within liberal regimes, different actors with different rights and responsibilities, um, uh, agreeing to maintain those rights and responsibilities and subject to monitoring, right? To maintain an order that other, that everyone has freely consented to, right? In the sense that, as we may recall, um, only by the early 1990s do you actually have essentially a almost consensus with the exception of three states and soon later on to be four states not being members of the nuclear, uh, of the nuclear regime. So is it, um, it is certainly seen by many, it's portrayed by many, understood by many as lying at the heart of the liberal order. Its legitimation, I would contend, um, continues to partake of those very same three elements that I, that I mentioned, right? It's um, certainly it's about, it portrays itself as serving the larger interests of a common humanity. Certainly it sees itself as being within the rule of law and the contention the it does, and this is where there is, I guess the greatest tension. It does suggest that not all should freely pursue their interests but they freely consent to limitations on the pursuit of their interests. That's quite consistent with liberal theory, right? We all freely, con under, in liberal theory, one freely consents to limit one's own uh, pursuit of one's own interests for the service of both one's own, one's enlightened own long-term national, long-term interest. I think it's also revealing that there are certainly much writing on the liberal order does, and I could, don't remember all of it, but Walter McDougall just most recently in Foreign Affairs yeah. referred expressly to the arms control regime and the nuclear regime as essential elements in liberal order. Yeah. So at some I, level, it's also consistent with my legitimation perspective. If we talk about the liberal order and things as being part of the liberal order, are they not part of the liberal order? Yeah, I, I, I uh, yes, thank you for your clarification. But I, I think if you if go that line, uh, I think it demonstrates the fundamental limits of liberalism itself as a part of, as a source of legitimation when I address this issue. <laughs> that point is well taken. Thank you. Thanks, Um, um Stephen. Thank you. That's a real. Uh, I'll take my hand down. Um, thank you for um, that paper. I thought that thought the framework is very interesting and very thought provoking. Um, my question comes down to um, this. No, yeah, it kind of comes back to this question of what liberalism is and how, in many ways, liberalism is for me a very much of a moving feast over the last seventy years or so. And I actually think the the point you mentioned in passing about the difference between embedded liberalism and neoliberalism is really really important to this and to the patterns of dissent that we're starting to see. 
because I think that shift um, created a lot of the problems we see. Like it's not just a reaction to liberalism in some abstract sense, but to a very specific take on liberalism that's producing d dissent, um, very specific patterns of dissent within core countries that lead to national, accelerated nationalism in America and elsewhere, but also to various patterns of resistance from states outside who want to be, they want to be part of the global economy, want to be part of neoliberalism, but also want to have more control of the rules and they're not getting it. And it creates a very uh, specific pattern, very, you know, very, you know, very clear problems. So I guess the, the question for me is whether, um, how, how, how much that's a problem for your model that liberalism has, has changed a lot in terms of the way it shapes international order. And maybe this is a problem for liberal international order scholars more generally that they kind of don't, haven't grappled fully with neoliberalism, I'm not sure. But specifically for your model about just the distinction between exogenous and endogenous forms of challenge, if you've got this, 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 this language of neoliberalism, which we're very clearly getting various forms of consent, dissent from both states inside and outside the kind of the liberal world, um, what that means for your for your theory? So I think the um, you know I, I one of the challenges here is trying to specify how much does this matter versus neoliberalism, right? There are many variants of liberalism. Liberalism itself, as you said, what is liberalism? Liberalism has no consistent meaning over history, and the best work, whether it be Duncan Bell's writing on it. If, very important essay for me was an essay he published back in, I think it was 2014 in political theory. Helena Rosenblatt's new book on liberalism is all about tracing the varieties of ways in which things come to be understood as falling within liberalism. This isn't directly an answer to your question, Stephen, but I want to just use this as a point of entry. So for us, what matters is how was the liberal, how has the liberal order been legitimated? I'm less concerned with what is liberalism, what is some kind of liberal hardcore, and then saying if things that fall outside that hardcore, if they're treated as liberalism, then it's part of, then it is liberalism for me. And that's consistent with say, the way more historically oriented scholars working in the Quentin Skinner's mold, like, uh, like um, Duncan Bell or Helena Rosenblatt would be talking about liberalism. Now, what you're pointing to Stephen is very important, which is there are many variants of liberal, of the ways in which the liberal order has been legitimated. And I would, I would even expand your point to say different, there are differences in the ways that the trade regime was legitimated vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear regime, vis-a-vis -vis the investment regime, right? So for sure, we can get more fine-grained. But what Stacey and I are trying to do is say, let's take a very thin understanding of liberalism, right? There's something that is a consensus, that there is simply no doubt has been at the core of how the liberal order has been legitimated really over time. This has been relatively constant, I would say. And I think we can easily, and we had do in the paper, draw on quotes, everything from the 1940s to the 2000s to show the consistency of that and say, how far does that take us? Now, your point is within, I think the next, if you buy this, then it becomes, okay, then from there, how much more has the neoliberal turn complicated matters further? How much does that move you off that baseline? And that would be sort of, if you will, the next step in this development. But what we're trying to say is let's even if, forget neoliberalism, just work with our three basic liberal premises without sort of the hardcore free market ideology. Um, and one nevertheless ends up with real tensions and real disagreements that are not directly traceable to neoliberalism. And that's what we trace out in the paper. Um, thanks. I've got Kai next. Uh, yes, uh, Rong, as always, great project. Congratulations. Uh, I have uh, two quick questions. One is your response to Eikenberry's argument on the evolution of the liberal international order. In 2009, Eikenberry published a piece in the Perspectives on Politics, and he argued that the liberal international order was experienced the crisis of its success. It is why we witnessed the evolution of liberalism or liberal international order from 1.0 2.0 to 3.0. So if liberal international order is experiencing its evolution itself, we might witness a new version, like the 4.0 version of liberal international order itself. So if that's the case, the order contestation or all the challenge you mentioned seems to be normal uh, in the process of evolution. So how you answer this question. The second question is about the role of US hegemony. In your model, you talk about the principle rules, 
but the, you never, you, you, you know, you did not mention the US hegemony, the role of hegemony in the international order. So what's your take on the US leadership or the hegemony in the international, uh, liberal international order? Thank you. Okay, great questions. Um, so Eikenberry's role, I mean, I find Eikenberry deeply contradictory because on the one hand, the claim is that the liberal order is extraordinarily resilient. It's not clear to me. To me, it seems that liberalism should not experience crises from Eikenberry's standpoint. If you take the theory seriously, rather you should have a institutions that are incredibly responsive because they are transparent, because they're inclusive. You certainly should not have crises of legitimacy. So I honestly don't understand John Eikenberry's perspective on perspective on this. Um, the liberal order is simultaneously resilient and always incredibly fragile as far as Eikenberry is concerned. I, I really honestly cannot sort that out. If you can explain it, uh, I would really appreciate that, appreciate that. But I think that the point, if I do want to read Eikenberry more charitably, the point about the evolution of liberalism is not, I think, one of a movement from crisis to crisis, but he would argue is rather a statement, I think, of the ways in which of the very resilience of the liberal order because of its inherent legitimacy and transparency and inclusiveness, and because no one has incentives to abandon it. So Eikenberry would say that a lot of what he was is tracking and the response to the evolution, if I'm gonna sort of work our frameworks together, he would say it's about a response to order consistent contestation. And the evolution is because is step by step, the ways in which the liberal order is so flexible and capacious in responding to these different waves of order consistent contestation. But the story that Eikenberry tells as best I recall it, and it's been a little while since I read it Kai, in that 2009 article is not one of repeated cr deep crises of order challenging contestation. Right. And the turn to order challenging contestation, the only way Eikenberry can make sense of that is to say, this is either the rise of illiberal powers or it is illiberal survivals from the past, right? So nationalism, once again, rearing its ugly head. That's how I think, I think that's how John would make sense of, would be his argument as to why liberalism has evolved and why it's done so, so powerfully. Right, that it's just because it's the, the ways in which liberalism is constantly responding to order consistent challenges. But therefore, I don't see that piece or Eikenberry's work as really being able to engage within the terms of its own theory with order challenging contestation. Now, um, I might ask you to specify a little bit better. I mean, the question of what is the, are you really asking about where, where is US hegemony in my story? So US hegemony appears at the very beginning. You don't, I accept, John Eikenberry's larger story in After Victory of the importance of hegemony in establishing the nature of international order. For that matter, it wasn't original, you know, it's also part of Bob Cohen's story. The book is literally titled After Hegemony for a Reason in 1984. So that idea that it is great power, perhaps at key moments often historically having been moments of uh, great power competition, that that's the, the role, an important role played by US hegemony. I think one is hard pressed though. You know, the other question is, well, do we see, is, are we simply seeing is what we are observing in the crisis, is that simply the decline of US hegemony, right? That's I think maybe the argument that you are hinting at. And that is of course, um, you know, here I, two, two points in response. The first is of course, um, we're not, you know, dating, this is sort of an unfalsifiable argument. How do we date the moment of decline of US hegemony? But leaving that aside, it's very hard to trace, um, let me, how to put it this way. Um, some of the key challenges, take, take, let me make it concrete about the nuclear, in the nuclear domain. Those key challenges in the nuclear domain are very hard to relate to the decline of US hegemony. Right, the rise of TPNW emerges from within the West, from, a, from amongst American allies. The rise of the, certainly it's hard to understand the rise of nationalist populism as a response to decline of US hegemony. I'm not, I, I'd love to hear an account 
that would obviously relate that. What you don't see, a lot of the challenges to the global trading order, the big challenges are probably not coming, you, many of you might disagree, but the challenges that I know that Stacey wants to write about are emerging more out of, let's say, India than China, right? So some of the key dynamics that you would associate with the fall, sort of declining US hegemony and the rise of the rest, that's not where we're tracing the origins of these key elements of contestation. But we have to, that is something that we uh, are, I'm ashamed to say that although we dealt, talked about it theoretically, in our empirical work, we sort of like violated the rule 101 that we tell all our grad students, which is address alternative explanations. So that's something that we've not really done. So I haven't yet, so I've not really, I recognize that that is one that we need to put front and center. But I think it is also revealing that um, uh, when certainly even realists have difficulty understanding, as I said, how you can understand from within their own terms, order challenging contestation doesn't seem to derive, right? Bill Walforth doesn't find that a persuasive argument in his important world politics argument article in 2009. Mearsheimer's own article in IS just a year, two years ago, right? Gives a lot of credit to nationalism which does not, is not sort of a story just to the rise and fall of powers. But I appreciate the point as one we need to address more forthrightly. Thanks, Ron. Um, we have Arif next, and then there's another question from a participant um, called Digby. So Arif. Thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Ron, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, how do you conceptualize the liberal international order itself? Because that is important for you at two, uh, important conceptualization of order consistent uh, contestation and order challenge contestation. Because if you understand international liberal international order as comprised of different domains or issue specific orders, uh, and then uh, across each of those domains, if we say, for example, international trade order, military and political alliances order, or the human rights and human, human protection order, in these domains, these components or these issue specific orders within which, which basically uh, forms the, the overall uh, liberal international order, they face a different challenge uh, from different actors from its core liberal Western states and from the research and rising powers. That is, I think, important because, uh, yeah, di 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 different domains of this order faces different, different forms of contestation. It can be uh, order consistent con uh, contestation and order challenging contestation as well. So that was my question, how you conceptualize the order? liberal international order. Thank yeah, you. I think, that's a, I think that's a very fair point. And it's reminiscent, I think, of Ian Johnston's important, important work on how China relates to liberal international order, right? Where Johnston's essential, con essential argument is that China doesn't relate in any consistent way to, inter to liberal international order, it relates in different ways to different issue specific domains, Arif, as you, as you just suggested. Um, you know, this is one that, that, that we have struggled with. We're, play we're playing on a very broad canvas here. And it doesn't allow for more fine-grained accounts as to why you would get order consistent or order challenging contestation from particular different actors within particular orders. I think one would have to, and I think that uh, what I would say is that the way to extrapolate, right, would be for us to do a more fine-grained accounting of how was a particular domain legitimated. And then what kinds of dynamics did that then generate within a very particular issue domain? So that would give us more purchase on sort of the kind of variation that I think that you are that you are alluding to and suggesting that we're missing by painting with extraordinarily broad brushstrokes. That's at least how I understand your question. I hope I've got that right. But I think that that would be, I think, an important extension akin to, in my response to Stephen's question, um, akin to tracing how, in fact, liberal order has been legitimated differently over time. It's also been related, been legitimated differently in different spaces. And I think that you are right to do that. I would view it as a success if one says, okay, you've got a provocative argument here. You're painting with two broader brush strokes and you're without sufficient sensitivity to history. 
and to variability in history, we're gonna then take that and delve more deeply using that same approach. What is that, what kind of purchase does that give you about why we get uh, different depths of contestation within different kinds of different domains? And uh, you know, maybe maybe we should write a book in which we do that, but I don't think that's <laughs> You probably won't be able to answer every question in one article, but you can you can try. <laughs> um, thanks for that, Ron. So we, we're coming up to the hour mark. We've still got one more question um, on the um, in the queue. We usually um, finish up after that now, but certainly if there are questions, we usually we, we then keep going as long as that's okay with you, Ron. So should we keep going so, as long as there are questions? I know it's getting late there. No, it's only eight o'clock. It's slow. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Digby. I'll hand over to you. Yes, so good morning to everybody uh, from Phnom Penh, uh, where I'm not in a red zone. Uh, I'm only in a yellow zone, which means I can at least walk 300 meters from my hotel. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I came a little bit late into the conversation, but uh, there's a couple of things that I, I haven't, uh, that I think you didn't touch on although you did mention China just at the end, and of course that's my area of study in international relations. Um, the percentage, the declining percentage of um, uh, global trade, American global trade is one thing. And then the actual still existing multinational corporations percentage of global trade. So one is about 24%, the first one. And then the second one is 50%. So that's the, mass, the, the multinational corporations. You didn't really talk about that. Uh, and, and of course, I think in any discussion of the liberal national order, one needs to discuss uh, the financial and economic arrangements between states. And the other thing about contestation or competition, which, you know, collaborate, whatever you wanted to, to, to how you want to frame it, is that Russia and China, of course, um, are within the system in terms of trade, but, uh, you know, not in terms of non-proliferation, except for China is in non-proliferation, of course, and then the START treaty with Russia. So how do you respond to those questions about the economy and the existence of the liberal, the continuing existence of the liberal order? So I'm gonna completely punt on the economy, right? That's uh, my colleagues, uh, bailiwick for the purposes of this paper. And actually, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it's in such deep state of revision, I've not seen it in a few months. So I'm presenting, I had hoped when I arranged this with Danielle long ago, I hoped that we would have kind of a finalized paper. But, and even a few weeks ago, I hoped that, but then uh, hasn't come to pass with the end of the term here in the US. Um, I wanted to, to ask you with regard to nuclear non-proliferation, why do you say, if I may, why Russia and China are not part of the order? Am I misunderstanding? No, I, I'm saying that they, they are part of the order in terms okay. of nuclearization. That's, 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 Fairly, okay. fairly evident, I think. Although the fact that the the United Kingdom has just decided to increase its nuclear arsenal by forty percent is, you know, one very key, important issue that's going on right now. And the second, of course, is that nobody's been able, been able to measure exactly how many nuclear weapons Israel has, for example. So, um, but that's really not the part I want you to talk about. Okay. I want you to talk about how it is I that just, the U.S. Just, you know, the the I want you to talk about the economic part. I okay, want you to I talk about why the US has a declining share of global trade, but its, it's multinational corporations have still have around 50% of global trade. And so that, that, that's, you know, that's endogenous, exogenous, right? So like what, what, how to explain that with your idea of you know, the liberal order? Well, I, I can I, I mean, I have to ask you to, I mean, I didn't understand the second question, which is why I was asking about non-proliferation, but with regard to the first, um, you know, our, again, our central analytical question is trying to make sense of a deep contestation of liberal order. I guess that data point doesn't communicate to me, maybe I'm not understanding its implications, but does not on its face communicate to me anything particular about uh, contestation of international order. So we don't pretend, we can't explain everything about the nature of order. We're trying to, our analytical question is why and when and how do you end up with contestation of order challenging contestation. So the fact that the United States has 24% of global trade, but its MNCs are at 50%, I guess, can you explain to me what one has to do with 
what that has to do with our central analytical question. If you could help me along, that would be great. Well, the liberal order is based entirely on the, on, on the power of the economy, of the US economy. I mean, literally, that is the base of a liberal order. Are you going to try and argue that it's nuclear weapons and, and, and the military? Is that what you're going to try and argue? Uh, I, I think the liberal order is a, as precisely as you're, as I think Arif put it just earlier, there's a variety of different domains. It is worth noting that we would have said there was a liberal order. I presume most of us would say there's a liberal order throughout the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Um, the trade was a vanishingly small percentage of the US economy in those days. I, I would venture to say that the liberal order represents rather a vision for how to organize global politics and a set of institutions, only some of which have to do with trade. Obviously the Bretton Woods institutions, um, of course the IMF, the World Bank, one can certainly see the larger sort of peacekeeping apparatuses as part of bringing about a particular vision of cooperative vision of world order. So I'm reluctant, I don't, not denying that the economy is a big part of it, but I'm also, I would be reluctant to reduce the entire vision of liberal order to simply to the economy. And again, I'm just not sure that I understand and I'd appreciate if you could trace out what precisely you are suggesting by pointing to well, that. I'm just saying there's a series of events. There's a series of events uh, that start, well, I'll just say post Eisenhower, but, but let's, let's just, you know, talk about, uh, for example, the way, that, just, um, maybe because we're running out of time, maybe if we, have yeah. time end, we could come back to this because I can see another hand up. Sorry to be rude. Yeah. Interrupt you. No, there's no problem. Um, I, I wonder if time. We, let's go to Hian, um now, and then we can maybe come back to this at the end if we've got the time. Thanks, Thank Daniel. you, Daniel. Thank you, Ron. Uh, my question is actually related to uh, the previous question. Um, as um, to what extent is the liberal international order a American uh, order? As American is the dominating hegemony, and right now, when looking back to two thousand three, two thousand eight, two thousand ten, uh, these series events were actually. Um, the invasion of Iraq being criticized by its alliance countries and uh, the uh, responsibility to protect order was challenged by the Libyan intervention and the global financial crisis. These are all uh, consequences to a large extent, the behavior and policies of the hegemon. So if the hegemon is a key player, um, what, well, the, the basic question, uh, if we are seeing the international liberal order as or not uh, the American dominated uh, world order. And secondly, uh, what roles does players play? Um, as you said, the loyalty of players uh, matters a lot to the, the legitimacy of the uh, liberal international order. If the key players are challenging this uh, order, what does that mean to the legitimacy of the order? Thank you. Okay. Um, since we're sort of at, at time, do we want to kind of maybe depart a bit from the one-on-one? -on -one yeah, that's a good idea. We have also Andrew. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Hey, Ron, I crashed your uh, talk here for big, and I'm in Manila still. Um, I wanted to go back to the point about IPE. I'm not an IPE person either, and I, I missed the beginning of your talk, so you may have already uh, set up the parameters for what you're, what conceptually what you mean by liberal international order. Uh, but it seems hard to, I guess, divorce whatever argument you make uh, from, uh, from the liberal economic order, because I, I, I do think that that comprises a good, a good chunk of what, what our understanding of liberal international order is. And, uh, you know, I, so, so one point I wanted to make you in, in the blurb for your talk, you mentioned challenges to the international order uh, from right wing populists. But I remember in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was talk about challenges to the uh, liberal order from left wing kind of anti global, uh, anti globalists, uh, you know, the anti globalization movement. So my uh, two question is one, is that is that still a threat at all? Is it really right wing populist or, or is there any sort of threat domestically from uh, sort of the anti globalization left wing sort of movement? And the second is if we do think if the answer is yes, then it does make me think that uh, 
there needs to be more of a IPE story interweaved into your paper. In fairness, I haven't read the paper. I don't know what it's about, but but I do think that that IPE has to somehow be brought in into into the overall argument. So I, I don't disagree. As I said, ha, empirically, let me go in. It doesn't look like any other hands are up. So let me just speak to both of these. Uh, empirically, half the paper is about the trade regime. So uh, while the dynamics here, and I understand that that might be viewed as problematic, the dyna theoretical dynamics that we're pointing to don't have kind of conventional IPE categories at their core. The story that we're telling, we believe works equally in the, in the realm of trade uh, and helps understand the kinds of contestation that takes place in the trade arena as much as it does in the nuclear arena. I didn't speak to that, as I mentioned, because I'm not feeling quite as comfortable with that, and I don't quite know where Stacy is with that at this moment. But the theoretical dynamics are quite parallel. Um, as to whether the anti-globalization movement is still a threat and so on, I will leave off on whether that is, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert to know if that's how much of that's the case, um, how much we have sort of the anti-McDonald's movement is still going in France. But I will say that the for example, like the Seattle, not you, you're referencing in part is like in Seattle, 1995, right? And that is one of, that is an example that we would say of, of the dynamic of the revolutions of the virtuous in the same way in which TPNW is also a kind of a revolution, what we would call the revolutions of the virtuous theoretically, right? So these are, I think, quite parallel, uh, parallel movements. Um, uh, the question I was asked given, I hope that answers your question, Andrew, but I, I fully agree, right, that we, we're not trying, I wasn't trying in my response before to divorce this from the liberal economic order. I just think that the liberal order, as Eikenberry and many others who write about liberal order, write about, it's not, ex doesn't reduce purely to the realm of the economy. Um, the, uh, I think that the point that, Ayun, that you were asking is when the hegemon is not the, pro the chief problem, that the hegemon has failed to uphold the order itself. I think that's how I read that point. I'm not sure that I, that's what you intended. But when you said Iraq and the 2008 financial crisis, and you referenced a third episode, um, that these were all episodes in the 2000s in which to one degree or another, that the hegemon was not uh, itself true to the order and engaged, behaved in hypocritical ways or ways that seemed to undermine the strength of the order. So that's, I think, an important alternative argument to Kai's argument about sort of the structural dynamics. The other is the behavior and the choices of the hegemon. Um, and that's important for us to understand sort of the overall legitimacy of the order. I am hard pressed to draw, of course, hypocritical behavior on the part of the hegemon is as old as the order itself. In fact, part of the privilege of being the hegemon is that you don't have to obey the rules all the time. The notion that the United States really obeyed the rules all the time. I mean, if you look at Eikenberry's language and many of the other defenders of liberal order, they don't usually say that. What they normally say is more often than not, most of the time, right? Thus allowing them to say it was therefore more often that treated as largely legitimate. But I'm aware of no study writ large that shows that in fact, there has been systematically more hypocritical behavior. And now therefore the order is really under threat. What we are interested in is trying to understand how does that hypocrisy get read? And why does that same hypocritical behavior, which always of course sticks in the crawl, why does it sometimes yield order consistent challenge, right? Most the standard response to hypocrisy is, hey, you gotta follow your own rules. Why aren't you following your own rules? Order challenging contestation, it, is to say, is to then get inspired by the hypocrisy and say, no, we need something. Clearly, they are never going to behave by the rules. Now we need something fundamentally different. And so that's the dynamics that we are trying to understand because hypocrisy alone, the hegemon behaving in ways contrary to the order is both classic and has often been consistent with order consistent contestation. Right? as we like to say, um, Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue, right? So hypocrisy is something that's part of any principled order. Thanks, Ron. I might raise one little thing I've got on my mind that relates somewhat to that and then go to Cheng, um, and then we'll probably finish up if that's okay. I was just thinking about the TPNW and some of the, uh, and you mentioned that there's a discord between the NPT and 
for TPNW. And one of the reasons some give for that is that the US and particularly, I guess, the Obama administration didn't take seriously the negotiations around. They weren't part of the conversations. And perhaps as a direct result for that, but certainly as an indirect result from that, the um, test ban treaty doesn't have kind of a requirement to be in good standing with the non-proliferation treaty. And there's like, that's one of the reasons. And I wonder what that, what, what your arguments around liberalism and the way the US has understood and treated institutions can say about that. Um, that's just, I don't know if that's something that if that's in line with what you're thinking, but it is certainly I've been trying to grapple with that question myself. And I wonder if your um, conceptualization helps with that in some way. Um, Cheng, do you want to raise your question as well? Yeah, uh, thank you, Danielle. And uh, thank you, Ron, for this fantastic um, presentation. It's really uh, thought provoking. And uh, I, I agree, yet yeah, the, the fundamental paradox in the uh, liberal international order, I think you really um, highlight a very uh, a rarely discussed uh, aspect of this debate. Uh, but I was wondering whether we could have a uh, universal international order to begin with. Uh, so whether that kind of a, a assumption uh, can be questioned. Um, the reason I raise that is because whether any world order uh, in, in the end could uh, actually be subject to this kind of uh, tensions paradoxes, uh, because this may relate to this kind of uh, fundamental issues uh, between universality and the particular particularity. Um, we can construct a universal kind of idea or order um, and pretend it uh, serves everybody's interest if everybody follows the, the same rules, etc. But very often, uh, any order or any rule uh, have been constructed uh, out of a particular uh, historical context with a particular interest in mind. And so fundamentally, any so-called universal order uh, would have this kind of a building a particular interest at its core. So this uh, in the end would actually be its uh, undoing, uh, no matter how uh, beautifully um, promoted it is as a universal order. Sometimes the more universally um, sounding it is, the perhaps it could entice, entice uh, or attract other followers to jump in and to do uh, what they think uh, is good or is in, within the rule, but in doing so, the particular practice and the particular practice is always conditioned within particular kind of historical or specific uh, political economic context. And this uh, fundamental tension, I think, uh, is perhaps is not unique to liberalism or liberal uh, international order. Oh, yeah, I'd like to hear what do you, uh, what do you think about that? I'm just gonna add one more question onto the end of those two, um, Ron, with, from Ben. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> No, that's okay. Thanks, Danielle. And I'd like to echo everyone in saying what a fantastic and thought-provoking uh, paper. Um, listening to your model, um, you know, it's very impressive. This uh, and and as I understand it, the fundamental thing is that liberalism has these inherent kind of limits and hypocrisies, um, and this has led to a kind of challenge of the international order, the international liberal order. But I'm wondering, in in your conceptualization here, do you kind of underestimate the power, both normative and physical, of illiberal forces? Um, and do you reduce the reason they act uh, purely to their perception of hypocrisy um, and, and contradiction? In other words, illiberal forces act illiberally irrespective of these hypocrisies and work to undermine uh, the, the liberal order anyway. Um, the notion that, uh, you know, the model that you put forward, again, as I understand it, it's not my field, seems to suggest that they're really only motivated by these moments of, of gross hypocrisy or these inconsistencies. 
uh, or the limits of the liberal order, but, but you know, illiberal forces are illiberal anyway. They were illiberal before the liberal order started and they'll be illiberal after it. Um, so I just think we've got to be careful about reducing um, them as actors down to this very sort of um, uh, sim simplistic view of, of what motivates illiberal forces. Thanks. Okay, thank you all. Um, maybe just I'll do it in reverse order or a different order. Actually, I'll do first, let me run briefly to Ben and Danielle then to Cheng, is that correct? I see that right. Okay, um, so uh, Ben, I, I, you know, I think that I, we, I tried to be clear, but I failed. Um, I think there are illiberal forces, right? There are actors who have deep illiberal commitments, who have a radically different conception of how it is that global order or their own regional orders or, or a particular domain should be organized. Right, and who therefore have a deep ideological disagreement with what with the nature of liberal order. Um, what we've not done in this paper is clarify, nor I think can we, uh, what percentage of what the order challenging contestation that we see comes from the endogenous kinds of dynamics that we're drawing attention to, the endogenous dynamics that others draw attention to, or the kind of exogenous dynamics. The, the rise of illiberal powers or the survival of illiberal commitments within core populations, right? That is uh, probably, I think that is a perfectly fair question uh, that you and I think many readers will have, but I, I don't see how we are going to be able to, to navigate that in this paper. Um, I think that we have to show for the purposes of this paper that the dynamics that we are drawing attention to are not those derived from exogenous illiberalism, right? And as long as we can do that, it's sustained. But it is possible, and I think it's a fair critique, that look, very interesting, Ron, but you've accounted for 5% of the variance, shall we say. But Ben's accounted for 80%, right? And I, I think we have no way quite of, of navigating that and adjudicating that. Um, and maybe that's for a subsequent paper to try to sort through. Right now, we're just trying to establish the plausibility of these dynamics. But I think the point is very well taken. And we have to be clearer of course, that didn't circulate an actual paper. So we will, we are trying to be clear about the parameters and the limits of that. Danielle, I'm not sure I fully understood your question about TPNW. Let me say what, maybe I should just say what, what do we say about TPNW and you could tell me if it relates. Um, so TPN, what, you know, there is one strain of literature that including there are some in the um, sort of in the, those who were central to the nuclear ban treaty who saw it as quite consistent with the NPT who said essentially the problem with the NPT is it had a disarmament provision and the nuclear powers never took it seriously. And if they'd taken it seriously, there'd be no need. This is a purely strategic move on our part to highlight that because otherwise at every five-year review conference, it never gets any attention, right? And they pay lip service to it and then it disappears for the next five years. Um, I, my understanding, of TPNW is a little bit different from that view. I understand that's one common view, but there's another common view, which I think that you see associated with some folks uh, who were very deeply involved in ICANN. You see it in scholars like Harold Mueller, who say, no, actually TPNW represents something much more fundamental because at the heart of the nuclear regime, as it was understood in 1968, was an understanding that nuclear deterrence actually had a productive role to play. And that in fact, deterrence helped inhibit proliferation, right? When you have a stable deterrence system, then others who do, if they don't doubt deterrence, they are gonna be less likely to go and acquire nuclear weapons themselves. That view about the relationship between deterrence and proliferation lay at the core of the way that the nuclear weapon states understood it, but you see it embodied in the NPT. That is a radically different by my reading, from what you see in TPNW, where there is no understanding that nuclear weapons have any constructive role to play, and there is no understanding that deterrence and proliferation bear any relationship to each other. Right? So I see the move to TPNW in that sense as really quite a fundamental challenge to the nuclear regime as it was understood at the NPT, where the deterrence, where deter nuclear deterrence was one important pillar of the larger nuclear regime, right? Alongside non-proliferation, alongside ultimately a move toward disarmament. 
Now, it also epitomizes the revolution of the virtuous because the chief movers and shakers are NGOs located in the West and countries like Austria and Canada, countries located at the heart of the core, right? Who in fact are deeply dissatisfied, who recognize sort of the deep corruption at the heart of the nuclear regime. Those moving are not the traditional non-aligned. The traditional non-aligned were not interested in TPNW at the beginning in the slightest, right? And of course they had nothing to do with the humanitarian initiative that gave rise to TPNW. So I don't know that that really answers your question at all, um, but that's the way that, that's the debate that I was alluding to and that, that we are a part of, how we see it relating to our theoretical argument, but also crucial to our argument is that if you only see it is essential for us to show and to argue that TPNW is not merely a sort of, or is a form of order consistent contestation, right? Just a new way to get at what the NPT is trying to do, but in fact represents a fundamental revisioning. And I think if you, you know, if you read Beatrice Finn, I think this is critical and crucial to the way that she talks about uh, the nuclear ban. I see you unmuted. Did you want to follow oh, no, up? No, no, I, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> But, uh, but I think I've probably not understood the question fully, so we can I mean, I'm interested to... in this um, question of, you know, the US is often involved in the um, development of treaties and conventions that it doesn't end up signing, um, let alone ratifying. Yes. And yet this one, it, it didn't. And I wonder actually if that helped the, you know, this challenge to this um, liberal institution, I guess, as it was, non-proliferation. Um, I, I just, I haven't had really thought about it as, you know, what, what role, what was the implications mm -hmm. of the US not taking part, I guess, but that's okay, I, we can, I can um, think and talk so about it. I don't that. know enough in the, re, in the research I've done on TPNW, I haven't seen um, a really clear statement of why the US wasn't engaged. My understanding of, of my, the, I've understood it as follows, which is that the US wasn't engaged precisely because they saw TPNW as being such a radical threat. So in other words, your argument, as I understand it, is did the US, and I want to make sure I write it down so I don't forget it, did the US lack of part participation from the beginning in, well, although there was at the beginning, there was a little more openness, but to the humanitarian initiative and TPNW, did that itself, is that what led to it being sort of a deeper challenge? And I think it's, I, my understanding is that it goes the other way around, that precisely because the humanitarian initiative was rooted in a sense that nuclear weapons have no virtues for global security and non-proliferation at all, that the US said, no, no, this is a non-starter for us. And it wasn't just the US, of course, it was every, there was no nuclear weapon state that was yeah. deeply involved in this. Yeah. Now, I wanna speak, if I may, to Cheng's really important point. And I wanna just, let me, as I understood your point, Cheng, and I think I've got this right, um, and it's a question that we've been posed before, is the problem, to what degree is the problem liberal order? And, or to what degree is the problem simply any universal ordering project? That any universal ordering project, as you very nicely put it, will have a tension between the universal and the particular. A tension, to put it a little bit more in the terms that we use, between what, one conception of the public good that is being promoted and a variety of different pro, uh, conceptions of the public good, as well as private goods, right? The national interest itself is a perfectly legitimate basis on which to make claims. So uh, let alone a different understanding of what should be at the heart of a universal ordering project. Um, so this is really an important point. And I share your, I think what I understand to be your skepticism that, any univer that all universal ordering projects will ultimately give rise to order challenging contestation. I make only two points in response and I think that's right. Um, one, uh, any universal is that every universal, which reminds me sort of what is the famous line of Tolstoy, like every happy family is unhappy in his own way or something like that, right? That every universal ordering project is subject to order challenging contestation in its own way, right? And so what we are doing is in a sense, and I think maybe there's an important way that we can reframe the work in line with that important point, what we are doing is showing how the particular claims of the liberal order, which in the eyes of its defenders should not be subject to the dynamics that you are drawing attention to. Because as I can very well put it, it's so inclusive and multilateral and resilient and open, right? It's easy to get into and hard to leave, like the Roach Motel. 
um, that that is uh, that we are sort of tracing out how that plays out in the liberal context. I think there is potentially in the first draft, the draft of this article that was rejected at IS had two paragraphs on this and we're gonna have to cut them. And it'll have to be maybe ultimately its own paper. I think there is another strain of liberalism different from the dominant 1940s procedural liberalism that really informed the uh, liberal order as we understand it. There's another strain of liberalism that I think is much more amenable to potentially a much more resilient order without this kind of deeper order challenging contestation. And that I would associate with multiculturalism. That the deep pluralism implicit in multiculturalism as understood by theorists like William Connolly creates the basis for it, which is part of the liberal tradition in its own way, a different strain of the liberal tradition might create the basis because it's not universal because it is so deeply pluralistic may create a basis for collaboration and cooperation with lesser forms of order challenging contestation. But we haven't really played that out and the reviewers hated it. They glommed on to one paragraph led to like three paragraphs of anger in the reviews. It was quite frustrating. It was like, and we said, we are just gonna to toss this out there. We don't really, uh, we can't, we don't have the space. This is not the appropriate place, but you obviously will want to know how should liberal or how could it be organized differently? Because we've gotten that question repeatedly at talks um, uh, earlier uh, when we, <laughs> last time we gave talks back at the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a fundamental point, but perhaps you could uh, yeah, fend off this, uh, yeah, initial, Critique or a doubt about this kind of point, and you 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 hold uh, liberalism to account, yeah, yeah, to basically according to its own logic, this should be universal. It should not be uh, subject to this kind of a crisis. Yeah, I, I think that would be yeah would be a terrific point. Thank you. Thank you.